So what I'd like to discuss with you is what is involved with undergoing a reverse shoulder replacement. Looking at the picture, this is an example of the reverse shoulder replacement that I typically use. It gets its name because the ball and socket are actually reversed. So the ball is actually anchored to the glenoid or the socket. And what used to be a humeral head that looks like a ball becomes a socket once the ball is removed. Now the brand you see there is a brand called DJO, Don Joy Orthopedics manufactures those, that particular shoulder replacement. My relevant disclosure that I have when it comes to all shoulder replacements is that I have been working with DJO as a consultant for shoulder replacement surgeries for the last 10 to 12 years. I've been a consultant in addition to being a design surgeon. A design surgeon means that I sit with key opinion leaders who do what I do and work with a company to improve the design as part of a design team. And I was on the design team for the shoulder replacements that you see here and evolutions of that shoulder replacements that have had taken place in the past and in the future. The normal joint shows the ball and the socket in its natural, natural orientation. The joint is a joint because it's covered with cartilage. And what can happen, and, and in addition, the outer layers involve the rotator cuff. You can see there are four parts to the rotator cuff. And when you have a rotator cuff that's working, the rotator cuff can function by holding the ball centered on the socket by the pull of its muscle. The outer muscle, or the deltoid muscle, then can power the arm, resulting in a natural muscle balance that allows you to lift your arm. Now, if that muscle balance is disrupted, that balance results in a misfiring and the deltoid starts to work against you. It elevates the arm and prevents the arm from elevating in its natural mechanics. Arthritis is another reason why we often do shoulder replacement surgery. As the joint wears away, it can wear away at such a degree of severity that a standard shoulder replacement can be very challenging to have a good result. And so now there are a variety of reasons where we think of using a reverse shoulder replacement for both arthritis as well as for various rotator cuff problems that create dysfunction in the arm. But ultimately the symptoms are what drives your decision for surgery and things like pain that gets worse with time or worse with activity and keeps you from sleeping as well as functional loss all contribute to the ultimate decision that you might have for surgery. You might try things like non-surgical efforts, medication, cortisone injection, sometimes physical therapy, and most of what you do is modify your life until you come to a point where the quality of your life is affected in such a dramatic way that you consider surgery. Now, I've never told a single person that they should have their shoulder replaced. I let you make that decision because it really is a personal choice. Everybody has their own tipping point when they say enough is enough. Many times that occurs after trying non-surgical treatments and realizing that they're not effectively managing your problem. But whatever that tipping point is, once you have been told that a, sh that a shoulder replacement is an option, this is what goes on next. I typically do my shoulder replacements at Holy Cross Hospital, but we also do select cases in our outpatient surgery center. The surgery is done under a general anesthesia with the addition of an interscaling nerve block. Together with an interscaling nerve block and a variety of other medications that combat pain through its different pain pathways, we are able to provide a multimodal approach to managing pain. This has revolutionized the way that you recover from surgery and keeps pain at a manageable level as the rule and not the exception. Now the details of the surgery I will highlight here. The surgery involves an approach with an incision along the natural crease where the deltoid meets the chest. It's called the deltopectoral approach. It allows me to access the shoulder if there's any portions of the rotator cuff that prevent me from seeing, I will release those temporarily, gain access to the joint, remove the ball off of the humeral head, shape the bones to match the parts that we will use, and on the humerus side, the ball is traded for a socket, 
and on the glenoid side, what used to be the socket becomes a ball. And this is a surgery that typically can take around an hour to an hour and 20 minutes to do. The recovery involves three phases, and the first phase is a healing phase. During that phase, the exercises and the therapy are very simple. Pain is very well managed, and all we ask is that the brace that you use be worn at all times with the exception of bathing, doing exercises, and changing your clothes. The exercise that we have you do is seen here involves a pendulum swing exercise where you lean forward, you let the arm dangle, and you make circles the size of a basketball in the clockwise and counterclockwise directions. You do 25 repetitions of those three times a day. Now you do have the ability to use your arm for activities that are in front of you. So for example, if you're wearing this brace, you could release the wrist strap and do activities in front of you. You can cut and eat food. You can type and write. You could shave and brush your teeth and put on makeup. Those are all activities that are involved in the front plane in front of you and they're very safe. The brace will be worn for a total of six weeks and that will take you through this healing phase. Now the second phase is all about getting your motion back. There are stretching exercises that you do on your own independently that will teach you, that will help to improve your elevation and your rotation. Very, very rarely will any of my patients go to a formal physical therapy. The therapy is done every day, and I'm a huge believer in therapy, but it's self-directed, done three times a day on your own independently. The only restriction you have during this second phase is a lifting restriction, where we don't want you lifting anything more than two pounds. By the time you reach the third phase, this is where we start to allow you to start returning to all of your activities and we eliminate the restrictions. We're asking you to begin working on strength activities, returning to the gym or swimming or tennis or golf or whatever activity that you'd like to, but do it on a gradual basis with a slow return to those activities. I'm very proud of our research department. And we are very much involved in a variety of different projects at the same time, but all of them are really focused on trying to understand how patients can improve their process of getting better and healing from surgery. Two studies that we did several years back look at how long, looked at how long it takes for people to get better after a shoulder replacement. And what you see here is pain relief generally happens quick. Function sees improvements at three months and at six months but then it plateaus off. Most of your improvement will thus happen between the three and six months of the recovery process. Reaching behind your back is always a challenge and it is about the most unpredictable thing that we've seen after reverse shoulder replacement. Here's an outline of our, our plans for seeing and monitoring your recovery. Before surgery, I get a CT scan for all of my patients. I often will use a virtual planning software to take your CT scan, put it into a software platform that allows me to virtually simulate your surgery. The CT scan is necessary to be able to do that. A medical clearance is typically done by your own medical doctor. At 10 days after surgery, your sutures are removed. At six weeks, we go over stretches. At three months, six months, a year, and once a year after, I do like to check x-rays. If I don't see you for several years and something changes, I like to have a baseline of progression to understand if any changes have been progressive or if they happened all at once. It can dramatically impact what we have to do with any radiographic findings. So I do like to see you once a year after we get past the first year. There are always risks to any operation, and there's a laundry list of things that are listed here that are just examples of some of the things that can happen. The overall chance typically for having a complication sits somewhere around five to seven percent. If you flip that the other way, the odds of you having a good result without complication are very high. When we look at our one and two year patient satisfaction after reverse shoulder replacement, they're in the high 90s in terms of overall success rates. From a medical standpoint, the medical risks of having your shoulder replacement of having a shoulder replacement have actually been shown to be less than if you had a hip or a knee replaced. 
things like blood clots are very rare unless you've had a blood clot or have high risk factors for blood clotting. The chance of the, uh, the, we till we do not need to put you on an anticoagulant. Transfusions are very rare, and these days we have gotten so advanced with our surgical techniques and our management of pain after surgery that we routinely do this operation as an outpatient. We now tell most of our patients that if you'd like to go home the same day of surgery, that is a realistic opportunity for you to think about. That's all I have to say about reverse shoulder replacement. I look forward to helping you through this and answering any questions you might have.